You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. Hello, everyone. Lovely to have you listening to us. We are the Big Fish Arts Group. And recently we have been telling our spooky tales of old Sheppy in Rose Cottage of Curiosities. We've been telling these tales by candlelight in all the different rooms of the cottage, in the kitchen, the scullery, the parlour, the nursery and the ladies' boudoir bedroom. And you will hear a selection of tales all the tales are connected to the history of Sheppey. And if you listen carefully, you will hear many interesting facts that will teach you lots about Sheppey. Now, this is a story about the Warden Bay Hotel, which is now called the Cavern Club. It's situated at the northeast corner of the Isle of Sheppey. It's said to be haunted by a mad, hair-lipped poacher with a face as grotesque and strange as his personality. He doesn't love anybody. Nobody loves him. All he seems to have in the world is his old, dilapidated cottage, which is part of the hotel, his brown, half-starved terrier and an old clay pipe. But rumour has it that he stashed his last savings underneath the floorboards in his cottage and that he lurks around the building just to make sure that his money still remains. Well, the former owners of the hotel, a couple called the Moyes, decided one night that they were going to spend the night in one of the hotel rooms. Well, why did they do this, you might ask? Well, the guests had all refused to stay in there because rumours had gone around and it became known as the funny room. The hotel maid, Farry Frost, was heard to declare, under no circumstances will I ever set foot in that room. No, never. Well, they settled down for the night, but shortly, Fred Moyes reported, My wife flatly refused to stay there. She said there was something uncanny about that room. Furthermore, the couple's little dog refused to go into the coffee bar downstairs. And people who come and go still say they can smell odd smells. They hear strange noises and they still get a shudder up the spine even now you've heard one story about the warden bay hotel but did you know that it's got a second ghost this is about a london journalist called peggy martin clark she came to stay with her friend marion fabergé in marion's cottage Peggy said, at that time, it was just a small set of little artistic cottages. They decided one evening they were going to go down to the hotel. It was lit only by oil lamps and the shadows were everywhere, lurking in corners. They sat by the huge fireplace and listened to a famous pianist called Freddie Barbinger. The lovely notes floated out over the sea. Later, they decided to have a nightcap. Peggy said, I turned my head towards the piano in the empty room. My sentence was stopped almost before it started. I said quietly, there's someone on the piano. Marion didn't turn her head 
Oh, it's a warm bay ghost, she said airily. Mara, then Peggy said, I closed my eyes and I opened them again. It was still there. The faint image of a monk. I saw the folds of his brown habit falling down over the edge of his stool. I watched as a delicate white hand reached out and pulled the folds of his gown around. He turned his head towards me. He smiled and was gone. Good evening all. Good evening one and all. I'm now going to give you a story from the book of the man in black. The story is a story of love <laughs> and all things that are nice, what children can give you <laughs> and also fear. The story begins with a young couple they just got married in this little village and needed somewhere to live. The only place available is the old manor house, been empty for many, many years. Well, it had been haunted, so the saying goes, but no one had ever been or seen any ghosts and this young couple used to play there as children, so they decided to take it on. And the owners said they wouldn't have to pay any rent if they did it up, renovated it, which they started to do. In the meantime, they had a little girl called Polly. Charming little girl. Lovely, friendly, smiling. As time went on, Polly started to lose her niceness, a pleasant little outlook on life and being nice to her mother, and she started being very saucy, naughty, answering back. At one point, even shouting at her mother, which you know, no little girl should do, especially at only nine years old. Anyway, it just went on and on until it, her mother was at her wit's end, and she said, Polly, if you don't behave and stop being as nasty as you are, there will be something nasty happened to you and you'll be very sorry well the little girl just laughed at her mother and said don't be silly mother what can happen to me her mother said well we'll have to see she said but i wish you wouldn't be so nasty and in that night polly went to bed lay down blew the candle out on the side of her bed and started to relax Heard mum and dad, their mum and father, go into their room, shut the door. Everything was nice and quiet. Until, until there was a noise of the front door creaking, opening. Now Polly heard this and she thought, what's that? Mother and father still in bed, they're quiet. It's late. There's no one else who lives in the house. What could it be? And the door creaks again, shutting. Polly listened and she listened. And then a voice came flowing through the air, not loud, but menacing. And it said, Polly, Polly, you have been naughty. You have disrespect for your mother. You must respect her more. Do what she says and try. Ins I insist that you change your ways and be a nice girl again. Well, Polly by this time was shaking with fear. It was her name that was being called out. Couldn't be mistaken for anybody else. So she lay there, she said, I will, I will, I promise I'll be good. I will be good, I will be good. The voice said, well, Polly, be sure, because I will be watching, but you won't know. 
Well, the next day, when they got up, her parents couldn't believe the way Polly had changed. She was back to the wonderful little girl that they knew in the beginning, the girl that she they really hoped she'd be grow up into. This went on for another two years, being nice. But gradually, as she became closer to teenage, terrible teens, she began to go back into her bad behaviour. Bad, shouting at her mother, not doing what she was told, really misbehaving badly. And for a, a girl in coming up to her teenage, it's not very nice to try to handle them. So her mother said, if you're not careful, Polly, I don't know what happened last time, but I hope it happens again. He said, because you've gone right back to how you used to be, a nasty person. She said, oh, don't worry, mother, don't frighten me. That's something that happened last time was a trick. So her mother said, well, I don't know what trick it was, but I hope it happens again. Oh, she went to bed and her mother said, good night. She said, good night. Went up to her room, candle her light, reading for a while, settled down. Mother and father, gone to bed, all nice and quiet. And the door began to creak. It creaked to be open. It creaked to be shut. And Polly was listening and she went, cold and the voice came that she'd heard two years ago saying Polly I've been watching for two years and you are now back to where it began when I had to come last time now Polly I'm coming upstairs Polly now is shaking, she's cold, she doesn't know what to do, tries to find the matches to light the candle, can't find them. Oh, my goodness me, goodness me. Polly, I'm coming along the hallway. Oh, my goodness. Polly, I'm on the first stair. She doesn't know what to do. She said, I'll be good, I'll be good, I promise. It's too late, Polly. You had your chance. You were warned. Polly, I'm on the second floor stair. Well, by this time, she does, just doesn't know what to do. She goes under the covers. This goes on for the next five stairs. Polly, I'm on the landing now. Polly, I'm outside your bedroom. Oh, my goodness, what's going to happen to me? I will be good. Polly, I'm in your bedroom. She froze. Polly, I'm leading over you. Oh, Polly, I've got you! <laughs> this is the story of the Lady Lovey Bond, a two-masted schooner. The ship left London and set sail for Portugal. Captain Simon Reed had married that morning his beautiful bride, Annetta, and he brought her aboard. The crew were superstitious. Bad luck to have women on board. But they were OK once they started to taste the wedding feast and the toasts to the brides and groom. Love and laughter could be heard as Lady Lovibond passed Sheerness. Now, John Rivers... He had been best man at the wedding, but he was in love with Annetta. With no Annetta, no one will live, he thought. If I can't have Annetta, the captain can't have her either. He went up on deck in a jealous rage. He silently took a heavy belaying pin from the rack. He went up behind the helmsman who was steering the ship. Crash! shattered his skull, rolled the lifeless body into the water. John Rivers then took the helm and swung Lady Lovibond right over. In the captain's cabin, the crew were making merry. They didn't notice a slight change, of course, until, with a grinding crash, 
the schooner hit the Goodwin Sands. Mast snapped and toppled into the sea. Timbers rent like matchwood with ear-splitting groans. Down below, captain, bride and crew were trapped and helpless. Above the din of the dying ship, all could be heard was the hideous sound of John Rivers' revengeful laughter. <laughs> Lady Lovibond was sucked into the Goodwin Sands forever. Fifty years later to the day, Captain Westlake was aboard the Edridge. He was going close to this Goodwin Sands when a three-masted schooner came bearing down on him. He slammed his ship hard over. The schooner sailed past, a sound of merrymaking and laughter. Then it broke up on the Goodwin Sands before their eyes. Rescue went out, but there was nothing. A journalist, who had once reported a story 50 years before, remembered the story of the Lady Lovibond, and this, he said, was the first phantom appearance. On the 13th of February, 1848, the ghostly Lady Lovibond was seen to go aground yet again. Again, nothing and no one to rescue. And the same 50 years later, on the 13th of February, 1898, a phantom schooner was seen breaking up on the Goodwin Sands, but there was no trace of a wreck. Another 50 years went by, and in 1948, a large Italian ship was wrecked on the Goodwin Sands with the loss of all lives. It was said that the Lady Lovibond demanded live sacrifice for her 200th anniversary. 13th of February 1998, Meridian Television told the stories and asked ferries and ships and people on shore to keep watch. But the fog came down and nothing was heard, nothing was seen. The next date will be the 13th of February 2048. Some say the strange sounds still born on the wind from the Goodwin Sands are gull cries, but no gull hatched on the seven seas ever made such a noise. Only the moans of the walking dead from 234 ships devoured by the Goodwin Sands since records began. Only those sounds could ever be made. Such a heart-rending and forlorn cries and every 50 years the hideous laughter of John Rivers. <laughs> Next to the Guildhall in Coimbra, there's an alley. And once upon a time, there was a dreadful murder. Her name was Emma Coppins and she was age 16. This rhyme has been written for her. You pretty maidens lend an ear to what I will unfold. It is a dreadful tra tragedy, as sad as e'er was told. A base and cruel, wicked man with Satan did engage to kill and slay a pretty maid just 16 years of age. Emma Coppins was the servant maid for her, her parents grieve, returning to the house of God upon Sunday Eve. A monster in a human shape did meet her on the way and done his best, this pretty maid, to lead her far astray. Upon the Tuesday evening, she was on an errand sent. She met with Frederick Prentice, who was on murder bent. In an archway, he was seated armed with a deadly knife. He flew upon his victim and deprived her of her life. Then cruelly he cut her throat. The blood in torrents flowed, weltering in blood, alas, upon that road. The driver of the mail cart saw her lying on the ground. Assistance came, who did perceive the ghastly fatal wound. Near the spot was found the murderer's cap, as we may plainly read, 
Likewise, the deadly razor which had done the dreadful deed, justice pursued the murderer and he was quickly caught, charged with a cruel, barbarous deed. He to Sheerness was brought, now then confined in Maidstone jail in horror and affright, where the spirit of the murdered girl torments him morn and night. Her innocent blood for vengeance cries, hanged he'll surely be, when by a jury guilty found of this sad tragedy. The honest, blooming, virtuous maid, as plainly may be seen, was murdered by a villain base, and aged just sixteen, will plant the flowers o'er her grave. How blooming was her charms! Poor Emma Coppins breathed her last in the wretched murderer's arms. Frederick Prentice was hanged at Maidstone Jail on the 11th of January 1859. Although Frederick Prentice wasn't his real name, he'd only told the vicar of Queenborough his real name to protect his only living relative, who was his sister. So the vicar died and he never did reveal the actual name of Fred Prentice. To end this story, um, there was a rhyme that was found on Emma's body, and it reads, What is this that steals upon my frame? Is it death, which soon will quench the vital flame? Is it death? If this be death, I soon shall be, from every pain and sorrow free, I shall the king of glory see, all is well. Cease, cease to weep, my friends, for me, all is well. My sins are pardoned, I am free, all is well. Farewell, dear friends, adieu, adieu. I can no longer stay with you. My glittering crown appears in view, all is well. Did she have a premonition for that rhyme to be found on her body? My name is William Barton and my sister's name is Emily. Now I joined the Navy many, many years ago, around about 17, 1788, something like that anyway. I slowly worked my way up to the rank of purser and then I was posted to the to, for the Battle of Trafalgar onto the Victory, so I was a purser on the Victory big honour that was so all the time I'm making my way up through the ranks I'm sending my sister Emily, bless her I'm sending her some load of my savings the view, with a view to buy in a shop so that when I retire in a couple of three years time we'll have enough money to buy a shop well it was almost immediately after Trafalgar that was in 1805, I don't know if you might remember that. But just after that, my sister sends me a letter and she says, Willie, because that's what she called me, Willie, don't need, you don't need to send any more money because I've got enough to buy the shop and I've got the shop and I'm going to get it for you. But I won't tell you what sort of shop it is. And I thought, well, I never. So anyway... We get through the Battle of Trafalgar. Luckily, I never got a scratch. And then eventually, we pulled in the port. And I said to the skipper, I'm going to pack it in now. I'm going to retire. And he said, yeah, well done. He said, you've done over 25 years now. And I hadn't counted. Anyway, I get a lift in another boat and pulls into Sheerness Come through the dockyard, there's my sister Emily waiting for me, waving at me. Willie, 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 come and see the shop, come and see the shop. Well, of course, I didn't know what sort of shop it was, but being a purser, I handled everything, all the stores on the ship and all the things that the sailors might need of their own. And she said, there it is. And it turned out to be a chandler's shop. Ship's chandler's, well, that's right up my street. Just a job. And she blazoned my name right across the front of it in cold lettering. I did feel proud. Anyway, we got to get to work. So that's what we did. She had bought a house for herself just down Charles Street, 36, 
big three bedroom place and I was going to live there with her and we was going to use the shop and all the upstairs was going to be storage. Anyway, let's cut this tale a bit short. About 18 months after we moved into the shop, I'm cashing up the takings of the day. It's about nine o'clock in the evening when the shop bell, the, 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 the bell on the old shop door goes ting-a-ling-a-ling. And I thought, who the devil's at this time of night? I looked up and there's two scruffy looking chaps coming towards me down the shop. And halfway towards me, I recognised them. They was two of my old shipmates off the Victory. And I thought, they don't look like they've been doing very well for themselves. Anyway, we greeted each other, shook hands, a little pat on the back. I thought, well, we'll have to go and celebrate this. So just along from the shop was the Red Lion pub. So I finished cashing up and away we went. And we was going to have a couple of drinks, but it might have been three or four, or might even have been more, because when I got home, oh, to my sister's place, Emily, bless her, cool, I did copy. She let me have it left, right, and centre. She'd been all day cooking this lovely dinner, and I wasn't there to eat it. And I told her I'd been out celebrating. She said, Yes, I thought you might be. She said, But those two ruffians didn't like the look of them right from the start. So I thought, oh, well, I'll have to take it on the chin. So I did. Next night, about nine o'clock again, I'm cashing up. Now, a little bit more money on the counter this time. A couple of three guineas worth of goods sold. And the doorbell goes tink tink again. And these two so-called mates of mine come rushing through the shop. One of them's carrying a great big piece of lead pipe and the other one's carrying what looks like a great big bat of some sort big big lump of wood and they're screaming at me come on Willie tell us where's your money where's your money that's what we're here for where's your, you, we know you've done very well and we went and they hit me on the right across the forehead with this great big piece of lead pipe and it split my head open blood pouring out of it all over all in my eyes and everywhere and then beating me around the legs with the other bat and and then while well, one of them was beating me with whatever it was he was beating me with and the other one was going through the drawers and clearing shelves and looking for the money and they're both shouting there, where's your money, Willie, where's your money? And I wasn't going to tell them, no way was I going to tell them. In the end, they turned me over on my back and one of them, I don't know which one it was, but he was beating me on the chest, bang, 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 and beat me on the chest. And then they both ran off, come on taking what little money there was on the counter, but they didn't find any more. Anyway, about half an hour later, my sister Emily, God bless her, she comes down to find out where I am. And she sees me laying on the floor. She thought, thinks to herself, I bet that's them two ruffians that came in yesterday that he was with. So she nips out of the shop and just as she gets outside the shop, the two rosers come by. Now, that's what you call policemen these days. Two brothers have come by, so she tells them, come and have a look, come and see what they've done to my brother. They came into the shop and look at me and one thing or another. She gives them a full description of what they looked like and what they were wearing, and they said they would go and look for them. Well, it didn't take long, because would you believe it or not, they was only in the blooming red line, a couple of doors away, having a drink on my money. Anyway, so the brothers arrested them there and then, took them to the police station in Blue Town. There used to be one there in them days. And the next day they was taken off to Maystone to the Crown Court. There they was charged, they were tried, and they were sentenced to be hung by the neck till they be dead. And I thought, that's a bit strange. How come I'm seeing all this? And then I realised, blimey, I'm a ghost. I've got to be a ghost to be able to see all this because they was charged with murder. So from the time my Emily Blesser found me, I must have died and it wasn't banging me on the chest, they were stabbing me through the chest, right through the heart. And so well, there I was dead. And here I am now, a blooming ghost. Still, I had me revenge because they didn't find the rest of the money. And what am I doing here today? I'll tell you, I'm here keeping me eye on me money because I'm the only one knows where it is, isn't it? Even Emily didn't find all of it. 
Anyway, we'll see you later. Ta-ra. I'm the ghost of Edwin Smithers, later the parish of Westminster near Sheerness. When I was alive some 200 years ago, I did the most wicked thing I had to tell you about it. It was the screams that made me do it. I got used to the smell, but not the screams. I'm floating over the water like lost souls. Till my missus said she'd had enough. Couldn't take any more. I had to do something, didn't I? She left anyway. Couldn't bear to look at me, she said. Monster, she called me. Mind you, that was nothing to what the rest of the village called me. Mind you, they didn't peach. They ate my guts. Wish me dead, but none of them are peach. Not even the vicar. And even he'd like to see me strung up. Mind you, there's worse things than being dead. The bell roffin, navy called her. Well, us villagers weren't going to use no Frenchy name. And being what she was holding, well, it had to be the Billy Ruffian, didn't it? We were used to prison alts in our village. But kids, a prison alt for kids, that came as a shock, I can tell you. They brought them down to the beach in open carts. Straight from the courts. Not just London, but all around. Bit of thieving had done for most of them. But just looking hungry was enough. There were so many in those carts, it took six horses to pull them. I know they were convicted criminals and all, but it didn't take a party of lancers to keep the peace. I mean, they were just kids, and they are all shackled together, blubbering for their mothers, most of them. They say the youngest was eight. Well, I know for a fact he was only six. And it was only about three weeks before the fever got him. Got most of them in the end. Bound to, all cramped up together like that. We saw their little bodies being taken over to Dead Man's Island. Mind you, I still say it's a mercy. Death for those poor mites. I mean, what have they got to look forward to? If they survived life on the ruffian, it was Van Diemen's land for them in Australia. Hell hole, other side of the world. With plenty of work and beatings and precious little food to keep body and soul together. No wonder they were screaming night and day. Mind you, there's a lot that went on board that boat. It was nothing for them to give 18 latches of the cat and enjoy doing it. Know what I mean? Really enjoy doing it to kids. Makes you sick. Or putting them down a the black hole in a freezing dark with the rats and cockroaches and other vermin for days and weeks until they were balled up, dribbling imbeciles. We heard them at it. It was if you don't get out of bed, it's down the hole. If you complain you've not been fed, it's down the hole. If you don't treat me right, it's down the hole. If you scream out in the night, it's down the hole. If you try to give me a slap, it's down the hole. When I sit you on my lap, it's down the hole. Well, my missus says she couldn't take any more. Well, none of us could in the village. We're all fed up with it. So I had to do something. We've all got our own boats in the village. And the wrecking bar makes short work of those rotten planks on those hulks. One night, I rowed myself out in the dark. Rowed up beside the Billy Ruffian and wrenched open some planks with my wrecking bar. All the gushed in and I rode away as quickly as I could. I could hear gurgling and screaming in silence. Couldn't even hear a ripple. Except inside my head. Except inside my head. But if you listen at night sometimes, 
off the shore at Sheerness. You can hear the crying and screaming of the poor lost souls of those children of the Billy Raffian. And if you listen hard, you can hear the ghoulish sounds of those wicked guards singing, if you don't get out of bed, it's down the hole. If you complain you've not been fed, it's down the hole. If you cry out for your mummy, it's down the hole. If you complain of a sore tummy, it's down the hole. If you cry out in the night, it's down the hole. If you try and put up a fight, it's down the hole. Hello everyone. This is a story which took place in Rose Cottage many, many years ago. The family that lived in Rose Cottage were called the Kicks family. And I am Mary Ann Kicks, Mother Kicks. And there was my mother, and she was called Margaret Kicks. And I became pregnant with my husband. He worked down at the docks. But very, very sadly, on the day that our beautiful son, Lionel, the baby, was born, my mother was sadly knocked over and killed by a beer cart. She was run over, the horse trampled her, the wheels ran over her, and barrels of beer crushed her. And that was the end of my mother on the exact same day that our baby was born. Well, the baby slept in the nursery, the nursery which is in this house here. And there was always a a warm feeling in the nursery. And sometimes at night, we heard very faintly and it was the lullaby which my mother always sang as Lionel grew up he started to have the most terrible nightmares and every night he would kick his covers off and he would fight in the bed and in the morning his covers would be lying all over the floor. Usually I went in and and tried to cover him again but again he would kick all the covers, kick and kick all the covers off. But on the nights when we heard the those nights when Lionel woke in the morning He was all beautifully tucked in, beautifully tucked in. And we can only imagine who it was that came in the night and tucked her grandson in. In Rose Street, there were many, many beautiful wooden weatherboarded cottages, just the same as this one which we call Rose Street Cottage of Curiosities. But there used to be cottages all the way down the road, numbering up at least to 40. And in one of these cottages, a family lived. But there was a terrible, terrible disease. A scourge went through the children. Many, many children died of diphtheria. And in one particular cottage just a few doors down from here the little girl Caroline Pike caught diphtheria and sadly died and as was the custom in those days the child was laid out on the dining room table in her best white dress but the mother refused to have the child buried The vicar came to the house and remonstrated with her, you must get the child buried. The doctor came, come on, Mrs Pike, get that child buried. And the neighbours kept coming round. But the mother said, I know she's not breathing, I know her heart isn't beating, and yet somehow there is still 
the look of, of life about the child. I will not have her buried. Well, eventually, the doctor, the vicar, the mayor, the neighbours came round and they took the body of the child away and they took it to Trinity Church and had a hurried funeral and the child was buried in the corner of the graveyard where the other children's graves were. Well, a hundred years later, a hundred years and just a very few days later, an old man was wandering through the graveyard. In the evening, it was a cold November night, and he saw a little child wandering round in a long white dress. He hurried across to her to, to ask her where she came from and tell her to go home. It's too cold, you shouldn't be out in just a white dress at this time of the night. But as he drew nearer, the child vanished. Now we have looked into this story and we have looked at old newspaper stories and we've looked up the child, Caroline Pike, and she was indeed buried just at the end of October. And we have come to the conclusion that the child was buried alive and now she comes out of her grave and searches for her mother. Oh, it's cold in here. The wind fair cut through these cold stone walls. Oh, it's me babbies I missed most of all, I suppose. Me little winters, I called them. Twelve little winters, like the apostles. One for every year, when the cold cut so deep, I had to cuddle a bit of manly warmth in me bed. Cos I ate the cold most of all. Well, that and coppers. I didn't think I'd end up in here, not for a slab of soap. It came as quite a surprise, I can tell you. Still, probably my own fault. Father always said I had a big gob. I wonder if you'll care to tell the court, madam, why you had stole that soap, he asks me from up there. Well, I shall think it's bleeding obvious, me lad. Look, covered, me best pinny too. And I nudges the copper next to me. Blood, such a bitter shift, in it? Well, trust a bleeding copper to repeat what I said to the bench. Well, I ain't one to tell no lies. So I explains to him, his lordship was only helping me with something to pay towards the cost of feeding me babbies, me little winters. But he caught me, lifting his watch, his cufflinks, his tie pin, his purse, his boots, his hip flask. Oh, funny thing, I could have swore he was spark out. He never stirred till I started on his teeth with me pliers. Ah, suppose that's where most of the blood come from. No, my lad. They usually stays out till Harry chucks them in his cart. I mean, getting them to sleep is not the hardest part, is it? Him being a judge and all. Oh, saving your grace's pardon. Then he asks me... And where is your babbies now, my good woman? My constable informs me that your abode was empty. Are they in safe hands? Empty? No, your grace. Them coppers couldn't find them with two hands and a torch, your grace. Course me babbies was there all right. I talks to them every night. On the mantel is a lovely card brought to me by the first mate of the barge me eldest work, work, works on. At all of 11 years of age, already a seaman. Funny bloke, that first mate. Sobbing away he was. Oh, it's not good for a grown man to snivel like that. I told him, it's OK. It's only a boy sending his love to his mum. I'll get someone to read it me later, cos I ain't got the knowing of letters myself. There's Sarah and Judy, always playing hide-and-seek, they are. Probably in the larder, their favourite spot. I can hardly ever get them out. Jimmy, oh, 
He'll be below the floorboards and he ain't coming out till he's learnt his lesson. And there'll be Dennis and Jack, they'll be up in the loft and they're not coming down till they eat their dinners. Sally, well, she ain't been too well lately. She's been stone cold asleep on her cot now for the past couple of weeks. Fred, well, he went out to get some coal, so we'll be back shortly. Ah, or was that last month? No, I sent Peter to look for him last month. Fred is only five, you see. Ah, wait, Peter hasn't come back yet. Oh, they're all together, playing silly as they do. So you can see, they're all around somewheres. Well, apart from Lily, Billy and Jenny, they died of the fever. But there was a bright spot. I had enough meat by me then to last all through that last cold winter. And a cold bit of a winter it was. And I ate the cold. They means to hang me for a slab of soap. Listen, listen, I can hear them coming. <gasps> Sounds like a fair turn out for little old me. Oh, I can see me babies now, me little winters. We'll be together soon. Yeah, all together again soon. And I know where we are going to go. It won't be cold. My name is Hester. I like watching people who have pocket-sized telephones. My life would have been very different if I and my men have had them. My father was a farm labourer who worked hard and took pride in his cottage and family. Two children, myself and Harold, my brother, and our mother Anne. However, our neighbour was a lazy and a dishonest person. He finally drove my father away from our strip of land and his employment in Milton to take up another job in Harty across the River Swale. We left friends and playmates behind. I left Matthew, my special friend, who shared all things and all thoughts with me. He said he'd come and get me and we'd not be parted again. At 12 years old, dreams like this are so real, are they not? All four of us worked even harder in our new life, and Father was at last free from old Wilson's taunts and thieving ways. Our cottage became a home to us, cosy and welcoming. The garden produced our vegetables and fruit bushes flourished. We loved and cared for our chickens, and we even grew some flowers. When I could, I walked down to the edge of the river and tried to pinpoint Matthew's home over on the other side. I searched for a familiar face on the ferry. Both parents scolded me over the time I spent out there. Each time I left the shore, I laid another smooth rock onto my pile which I used as a seat. At home in my tiny bedroom in the dark of night and I couldn't sleep, I was sure I could hear my name in the wind and the waves hissed. Autumn brought mists and winter gave thicker fogs and gales. I gathered together my warmest clothes for my trips to the water's edge to look for Matthew. It was well over four years since we'd been apart and I knew at 16 we could be together. Each season I was confident he'd be there after lambing, after sowing crops, after harvest and after ploughing. Mm. Bravely, I asked some young farmhands from off the ferry for news. When they came over, nothing, nothing. Oh, they knew nothing at all. A few weeks later, I was sure I saw Matt coming amongst the passengers as I watched. He leant over 
and dropped something into the water. Slowly it bobbed her out, up and down, landing on the stones near me. He'd sent me a beautiful rose, picked from his mother's garden, which I remembered. Oh, I carefully carried it home, dried it and pressed it in my prayer book. I walked on air for days, knowing he still remembered, he remembered me. On his birthday in June, I sat on my rocky seat and waited. Oh, yes, here came the ferry, bringing the farmers home from market. In their midst, I saw Matthew, he waved to me and went to the side and dropped something else in the water. <laughs> what was it going to be this time? A toy sailing boat slipped ashore. He'd written something on the makeshift sail. Wait, Esther. Once again, winter arrived, and I felt sure this was going to be the time he'd come to get me. The wind swirled in the trees, and the waves swooshed, Esther. And the mournful curlews called, Matthew. Matthew, the will-o'-the-wisps lights still drifted over the marches, marshes. I still waited on my hard seat. My father's employee stepped off the ferry one spring evening and his face fell when he saw me. Gently, he told me he'd learnt that day of a boating accident the previous winter. My Matthew and his brother were lost. Well, who did I see then? Who gave me the rose? Who sailed that toy boat with the cotton sails which I treasure and I still have? If only, if only we have, have had a small telephone each.